Today we will look at the Russian guide and the British-Ukrainian report. Both cover the lessons from the Ukraine war. The Russian one is titled I live, I fight, I win. The rules of living in war. It is noted that the recommendations in the book are based on the generalized experience of those who fought in Afghanistan, North Caucasus and Ukraine. It was published by the All Russian Society, Russian Union of Afghan and Special Military Operation Veterans. The intended audience is explicitly stated shortly before the table of contents as follows. The collection is intended for servicemen of the armed forces of the Russian Federation taking part in the special military operation in Ukraine, conscripts, cadets of military education institution, employees of various security agencies. And according to Lieutenant Colonel Nicholas Moran, better known as the Chieftain, it is a really interesting read. Or in his own words, it's like 50 pages of rules to stay alive in war. And you're reading it, and you realize that this is a damn good document and Americans should read it as well because there's a lot of very good, useful information on how to stay alive and what is good and what is not good in war. The second source was recommended by Stephen Zaloga. It is titled Preliminary Lessons in Conventional War Fighting from Russia's Invasion of Ukraine, February to July 2022. I called this a British-Ukrainian report since it was published by the British Royal United Service Institute with access to operational data accumulated by the Ukrainian channel staff. Also out of the four authors, two are from Ukraine. Why not call it the Ukrainian report? Well, besides the language, institution and some authors, the report focuses heavily on what lessons the British armed forces should take into account. For simplicity, for the rest of the video I will call it the Rusi report. Needless to say, these publications are very different in many regards. While one focuses on combat and survival of individuals and small units, the other deals with adapting modern Western armed forces for future conflicts. Yet surprisingly, there are several parallels that appear in both reports. So let us take a look here. The Russian guide consists of 66 points and a few appendices. Meanwhile, the Rusi report consists of several chapters. For us, the most interesting chapter is the lessons identified for the British military, since there are some clear parallels in the Russian guides as well. So we take these five lessons and look what the Russian guide includes about them. The first lesson is called There is no sanctuary. The Rusi report states, First clear lesson from the war in Ukraine is that the enemy can conduct strikes on targets throughout its adversary's operational death with long-range precision fires. Moreover, in target states, the Russians have proven able to retain networks of agents in place to observe key targets and up-to-date their command on the movement of troops and stores. The Russian source makes it clear several times that the authors are aware of this situation. Survival rule number one, don't stand out. The fighting in Ukraine has been beneficiary of drones and all kinds of reconnaissance devices. The location of a unit can be determined by the movement of soldiers, the smoke and glow of fires, piles of debris on positions, anything that looks unnatural and stands out in the terrain. Snipers and spotters of heavy weapons use the same principle to select their targets. In order not to become their target, it is necessary to observe the main principle of camouflage, not to stand out. Particularly interesting is this entry that relates to the Second World War and learning from military history. Do not stay in the most conspicuous and large houses. They are most likely shot or booby-trapped. Our scout Ilya Starinov destroyed German headquarters during the Second World War. And today Ukrainian rocket men are destroying ours, where the chiefs have not studied military history and love luxury and comfort. The reference to the Second World War is not the first one in the Russian guide. Actually, the second point is titled The Great Patriotic War 2.0. The reasoning of the authors is that a lot of countries are helping Ukraine. Anyway, the Rusi report also mentions communication discipline and human intelligence. Moreover, as the Russians have found to their detriment, concentrated command posts inside requisitioned civilian buildings are similarly vulnerable to long-range precision fires unless all staff retain rigid communication discipline. Even the human intelligence threat means that locations should be moved frequently and key components of staff dispersed. These are all addressed several times in the Russian guide. 50. That's not the kind of movie we need. In addition to unmanned and radar reconnaissance, 
Our enemy makes extensive use of video surveillance, from roadside cameras to smartphones of school children. This cinema delivers real-time intelligence to enemy firing positions. To avoid becoming a movie hero and someone else crosshair, you must constantly monitor the area around your location. The problem of being geolocated via image data is also mentioned. The Ukrainian operator has only to upload your photos into the XIF data viewer and send you a 152mm package or a package of HIMARS. Although I have not found a reference about geolocating based on matching photos with Google Maps and other photos. Finally, the point of not using a cell phone to receive artillery shells is also mentioned. 17. Idiot with a cell phone is his own enemy. Any activation of a cell phone in a war zone leads to location of the subscriber and his geolocation, followed by an artillery strike at his location. The fact is, when you use a SIM card in your smartphone, it automatically connects to a nearby tower. And the Ukrainian cellular operator seeing your Russian number, direction finding it, determines the location to within 3 meters. I'm not sure about the precision here, yet according to a previous interview, this is pretty much how the Ukrainians operate. They call such cell phones appearing spring flowers. The next part in the Rusi report is about having reserve capacity, or as the report calls it, slack capacity. And deals particularly with the issue of ammunition, or better, the lack thereof. Warfighting demands large initial stockpiles and significant slack capacity. Despite the prominence of anti-tank guided weapons in the public narrative, Ukraine blunted Russia's attempt to seize Kiev using mass fires from two artillery brigades. The difference in numbers between Russian and Ukrainian artillery was not as significant at the beginning of the conflict, with just over a 2 to 1 advantage. Ukraine maintained artillery parity for the first month and a half and then began to run low on munitions so that by June the armed forces of the Russian Federation had a 10 to 1 advantage in volume of fire. It is particularly mentioned that during the high intensity fighting periods that Russia had used more ammo in two days than the British military has in stock. And if Ukrainian consumption was taken as a measure stick, it would last for about one week. Be aware that for other Western militaries this problem would be even worse. And I'm totally not looking at you here, Germany. Considering the more day-to-day -day survival and tactical nature of the Russian source, I did not suspect to find anything that might relate to that. Yet I was proven wrong. The source actually details how Ukrainian artillery fire is structured and if one gets hit by large amounts that Russian artillery is at work. To quote, Ukrainian artillerymen usually fire in bursts, two to three shots, a three to four minute pause to make corrections, then again four to six shots to finish them off. As a rule, there are no more than three such series. If the artillery fire is cursory with high consumption, it means our artillery is working and it's urgent to establish cooperation to stop this friendly fire. The next lesson in the Rusi report is about drones and it contains a real gem, namely the extreme loss ratio that people don't see when they just follow the TikTok war. Uncrewed aerial systems and counter uncrewed aerial systems are essential across all branches and at all echelons. Although critical to competitiveness by providing situational awareness, 90% of uncrewed aerial systems employed are lost. For the most part, uncrewed aerial systems must be cheap and attributable. For land forces, they must be organic to units for the purpose of both situational awareness and target acquisition. Now, for the uninitiated, organic to unit means that the drone operators and equipment are part of the units, thus they are trained together. This is crucial for cooperation due to training and the whole organization. The difference would be if drone operators and drones were in dedicated units that then would be attached to combat units. Yet what we can find about drones in the Russian source? Well, comparatively little. They are mentioned a few times, for instance. In addition to Soviet weapons, Ukrainian units are equipped with NATO anti-tank guided missiles, rocket and artillery systems. Each platoon has quadcopters, thermal imaging cameras and secure communications. Be aware one source claims that the Russian generally only have one drone per company, assuming that this information is correct and the company usually consists of two to four platoons, that means that the Ukrainians generally have a better tactical intelligence provided by drones than the Russians. 
The more interesting aspect in the Russian source about drones seems to be in line with the high loss rate mentioned in the report. The quadcopters can be destroyed by concentrated fire even with small arms. It is more difficult to control the front line of defense with the presence of light and medium UAVs. It requires electronic warfare and anti-aircraft assets. Now I'm not entirely sure, but I assume that the quadcopters refer to consumer drones, whereas light and medium UAS refer to military drones. This would also be in line with the RUSI report that notes, unmanned aerial systems should be split into three broad categories for land forces. The first are rotary type UAS, able to maneuver close to the ground and in complex terrain, fielded across all maneuver formations for the purpose of route proofing, reconnaissance, situational awareness, target acquisition, fire correction, and a wide range of other tasks. Whereas the other two operate at higher altitudes and operational depths. For more information about drone warfare, be sure to check out Military Aviation History's video on this matter. Although be aware that the Russian could have a completely different classification system here. The next lesson in the Rusi report is about precision. The force must fight for the right to precision. Precision is not only vastly more efficient in the effects it delivers, but also allows the force to reduce its logistics tail and thereby make it more survivable. Precision weapons, however, are scarce and can be defeated by electronic warfare. To enable kill chains to function at the speed of relevance, electronic warfare for attack, protection and direction finding is a critical element of modern combined arms operations. Besides the aforementioned quote about using an electronic warfare operator to counter drones, I did not come across anything relating to this in the Russian source. Yet this brings us to the final lesson in the Rusi report, namely, disperse, dig deep or move fast. For land forces, the pervasive intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition and reconnaissance on the modern battlefield and the laying of multiple sensors at the tactical level make concealment exceedingly difficult to sustain. Survivability is often afforded by being sufficiently dispersed to become an uneconomical target. By moving quickly enough to disrupt the enemy's kill chain and thereby evade engagement or by entering hardened structures. Be aware the difference to the first lesson here is that the first lesson was mostly about high level assets like ammunition stocks, aircraft as well as command and control assets. And so on the operational and strategic level whereas this lesson deals with the tactical level and land troops. Here the Russian source provides plenty of interesting points. This is mentioned very early on, namely in point 6, whereas the previous 5 points are more about the political orientation than practical aspects. The headline of point 6 is Ukrainian tactics is hit and run. If I am not mistaken it should paint a picture of an unfair fight. When Russian troops are detected, a Ukrainian soldier only needs to tap his finger on a tablet screen to get the coordinates of the target into the unified battle control network and a free artillery unit receives a command to open fire. The artillery unit that is in cover, factory workshops, basements of shopping malls, etc. advances to prearranged positions, strikes and hides in its hiding places. The defeat of the enemy is completed by mobile sabotage groups which are after a brief contact return to their strongholds, hiding behind civilians. Yet there is also very concrete advice provided as well. The success of the enemy is more often than not the result of our mistakes. Our main losses come from artillery fire on the march, at staging areas when setting up a field camp or a strongpoint, and from the actions of sabotage groups. To avoid adding to our casualty statistics, it is worth observing some simple rules. Number 1. On the march or in the rest area, keep a distance of at least 20 to 30 meters between vehicles. This reduces mass casualties from high precision weapons by 90%. Any commander who places his vehicle closer than 20 meters from another one is a fool and a pest. It continues. Number 2. Trench even at the temporary unit locations. If you stop, dig a trench. A small trench is a good shelter from shrapnel and shockwave. Number 3. Keep constant surveillance, wherever you are on the front lines or in the deep rear. Keep an eye on the sky and surrounding terrain. Number 4. Self-organize. The crew of each vehicle or squad 
should become an independent tactical unit providing guarding, camouflage, maintenance of combat equipment, engineering equipment for positions, meals and rest for the fighters. In point 46 it is particularly mentioned that the small infantry shovel is the soldier's best friend. The document notes that it can be used for digging, hitting, as an armor plate and even a pan for cooking. I particularly like this analogy. The key of a spade's versatility is a sharp blade. With a dull shovel, just like with dull people, you don't get much work done. So as you can see the guide also addresses the Austrian bureaucracy, or in a far more possible light than I would do. In another point it is noted that the chances of survival in a trench during artillery attack are 10 times higher than in the open. Maybe you have seen videos of Ukrainians showing how Russian positions are littered with trash. As always, it is hard to tell if these are just exceptions. But the Russian source specifically mentions this problem in regard to being detected. 54. Omen. Garbage in position. The enemy chooses to strike the weakest link in our defenses. It is hit by artillery strike, stormed by enemy infantry and probed by reconnaissance. Identifying the weakest link is simple. Not only the number of defenders, but also the nature of service organization is determined by the amount of trash on the position. Garbage is a direct result of poor discipline. Disorder in the trenches, laundry on the ropes, trash on the parapet, litter in the fields and plantings around the outpost due to the lack of latrine speak of the lack of a firm commanding hand and the lack of control over the unit, where each lives his own life. And this is a weak link that is sure to be hit. This focus on discipline is not really surprising. Discipline might not be that important with highly motivated troops, but it's very important to maintain a decent level of effectiveness. Before we conclude this video, there are more interesting points in the Russian guide. Yet there is one that directly relates to discipline and that is also quite common on social media. It is about looting. The Russian guide is strictly against it. To quote, Bakshis in oriental languages literally means gift, in broader parlance a trophy. Money, jewelry, all sorts of gadgets, cars. Everything that was valuable in civilian life is worthless in war. The main value in war is life. And to preserve it you must leave all thoughts of material things and live the war. It has been seen that as soon as a fighter starts sneaking around abandoned houses for bribes, he has signed his own death warrant. War does not tolerate looters and takes them out first. Rest assured, the looters will collect all the mines in the area, get hit by friendly fire of their neighbors, light up your positions, put themselves and you under the enemy's artillery. But the sordid thing is that the Bakshish change people. They turn a fun-loving hero into a coward and miser, living only for his trophy. Such a fighter becomes a burden. He's of no use. There is a conflict and quarrels around him. We must stay away from him. By the law of karma, the biggest shell will come to his trench, the most accurate bullet or the most intrusive investigator. Nobody cancelled the criminal penalty for looting. The parts about karma and similar points probably make more sense if you consider that the 64th point out of 66 points has the title, most importantly, God is with us. To summarize, although the audiences of the Rusi report and the Russian guide differ widely, the similarities are striking in many areas, particularly when it comes to surveillance. Another interesting aspect was that the lack of artillery ammunition for Ukraine and the Russian evidence of artillery ammunition is mentioned directly in the Rusi report and indirectly in the Russian guide. This is like the last video for my main channel in 2022, I might stream in the upcoming days. Anyway, I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Metal New Year. Thank you for watching and see you next time.